Here we go, y'all. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, the whole armor of God, like you've never heard it broke down before. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it kind of fast here. Follow with me, New King James Version, then we're going to break it all the way down. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, let's stop right there. We are fixing to go back in and we're going to break this down. What Paul is describing here, what Paul is describing here, what he is calling the whole armor of God is primarily a defensive system against your enemy. Who is your enemy? Let's go back again. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go back to verse 10 right now. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, not in your strength, in the strength that is in the Lord and your union to the Lord. That is where your strength comes from. Not in yourself, but in the union that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, focus please. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. If a person comes at you, that's not who you're wrestling against. If a group of people come at you or an organization comes at you, that is not who you're wrestling against. You're wrestling against what is behind them, what is driving them, what is manipulating them, what is deceiving them into attacking you. And this is what that is. Watch this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Stop. Those are the four levels in Satan's kingdom. Satan's kingdom is very organized. Those are the four levels in Satan's kingdom, which I will be breaking down next week. But for right now, just understand that Satan has a hierarchy with he himself at the top. And it has four different levels. You don't deal with every one of those levels. There's only a few of those levels that you are actually responsible to deal with. Okay, and we will go over that. But for now, understand that there is a hierarchy in Satan's kingdom in the spiritual realm that you cannot see with your natural eyes that is driving those that are against you or systems that are against you or government entities that are against you. Whatever is coming against you is being driven by some member of this hierarchy, which is demonic, and you cannot fight this thing with guns or knives or any natural means because you are not wrestling against flesh and blood. You are wrestling against all these different demonic forces and presence and beings. Okay, let's continue on. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day when you come under that attack. And having done all to stand, as I said a moment ago, these weapons are primarily defensive. We're going to get to that. Now, let's follow along right now. First one right here. Verse 14. Stand therefore. Stand therefore. 
having girded your waist with truth. This is known as the belt of truth. OK, many times in many different books that folks will write, they will ha have the picture, the image of what Paul would have been seeing at that time, which would have been a Roman soldier. And they're describing the dressing of the Roman soldier. This is known as the belt of truth. This is what I need you to know right now. That truth right there, that belt right there that so many describe as holding the entire uniform together. That truth is integrity. Write that in your notes right now. That truth right there is integrity. Grab that. Grab that right now. Integrity and character of you. What you do when ain't nobody watching and you don't think nobody's watching. What is in your heart when you don't believe that anybody knows what is really in your heart. Integrity. Write that down. Thank you. Let's continue on. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is the second piece of equipment. Again, primarily defensive systems in nature. The breastplate of righteousness. Write this down. Aware that as you are ready, excuse me, the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness here means an upright heart. An upright heart. A heart without bitterness or envy. Write that down. A heart without bitterness or envy. Praise God. Moving on. I started to jump ahead there just for a moment too. Verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. On your feet, the sandals that so many describe is the preparation to preach the gospel of Jesus. Now I want you to put this in your notes right now. The preparation of the gospel of peace. This is by revelation of the Holy Spirit of God. This is being aware. Being aware that as you are ready to preach the gospel. The enemy is near. Listen to me. It's very important. Deep, deep spiritual. This is the meat. What this means is not being just prepared to preach the gospel. As so many say. Let's read it again. I'm going to read it right here out of the New King James Version so everybody can grab this. And having shod your feet, put on your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have to be prepared with this spiritual knowledge that as you are going to preach the gospel of Jesus, the enemy, your enemy, which is described in those four levels, those four levels of hierarchy is very near, but you have immunity against him. And we're going to go over that. But be aware of that. As you are going to preach this gospel, you have got to be prepared and understand that there is an enemy that will try to hinder what you are doing as you go to preach that gospel. Very important. Very important. Write that down. Here we go, y'all. Next up. Number 16. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I'll read it again. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Everybody got that. Very, very important because the enemy will be firing arrows at you in your life. And you have got to have this shield of faith. And I'm going to define it right now. The shield of faith is your system of defense encapsulated. The shield of faith is your system of defense encapsulated. Every Member, every particular member 
of this armor right here, besides the last two that I'm going to go over, are defensive and part of your defensive system. But the overall defensive system is marked by this shield of faith. Without understanding that you've got to stand on your faith in the foundation that is the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified on that cross and buried in that tomb and rose in the dead, you'll be defeated every time. But with that shield of faith right there, you can block every accusation and every fiery dart of the enemy because at the base of it all, he is trying to attack your faith. He is trying to attack your faith in Jesus. He's trying to attack your faith in the authority of the word of God. It's a constant barrage of attacks against your faith. And you've got to have this shield right here. You have to know what it is that you believe. Very important. Next up. And take the helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? I've heard many try to define this. Listen to me. The helmet of salvation, write this down, is understanding your position with Christ and your union to Jesus as your advantage. Write that down, please. The helmet of salvation is not a head knowledge that you are saved. That falls under the shield of faith. The helmet of salvation is understanding your position with Christ and your union with Jesus as your advantage. Because it's a war, see? This is a war. This is describing spiritual warfare and the armor that you need to have at all times. Everybody got that. Praise God. And the sword and the sword of the spirit and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit. Is the word of God now. Please listen to me because now we're going to get really deep here into revelation of the Holy Ghost. Please follow with me right now. You're going to want to share this with somebody that you know. That has studied the word, has been up under somebody, has read a book, has studied a book on the armor of God. Praise God. It's all good. But this is by revelation of the Holy Spirit right here. Okay. This is where most folks would stop as the sword of the spirit being your offensive weapon against the enemy. The rest of the armor that we just went over is part of your defensive system. Okay. But then you have this offensive weapon, which is this sword, which is the word of God. And folks will point to the fact that when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was fasting, when he defeated Satan during that 40-day fast, he defeated Satan by speaking the word of God to him. And that is correct. That is correct. In part. In part. Now grab a hold of this because this is going to take you to another level in the supernatural realm. This right here is going to make the enemy know who you are. And that you mean business when you come to battle. Yes, Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness, in the desert, during that fast for 40 days. Satan was trying to use the word of God and Jesus was defeating him by quoting the word of God back to him three times. And when we read this here in Paul's description of the whole armor of God. And many folks will say this is the offensive weapon right here, and it is the word of God, and this is what Jesus used in the wilderness. They're correct in saying that. But I'm going to show you the other offensive weapons. But first, we can't stop there, see? Because that's not the entire armor of God. 
by revelation of the Holy Ghost. That is not the entire armor of God. Let's continue. Next verse, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Stop right there. This weapon, this sword of the spirit that is the word of God is up in here. This is that hand to hand. You have a weapon through prayer and supplication, praying with all prayer at all times with perseverance, as that word says right there. That is your long distance ballistic missile. Grab that now. Because when we get ready to go on to these other offensive weapons, it's all going to come together and make sense. You have a weapon of prayer that is listed here in the whole armor of God that is neglected by 95% of the Christian church because they stop with the sword of the spirit being the word of God. Not perceiving that Paul included all prayer and all supplication in perseverance. It is extremely important that you understand that you have a long distance weapon, even when you're engaged in spiritual warfare right here, because there are four levels to Satan's kingdom. And sometimes you are fighting against things that are up here. Listen to me, that are up here where the angels were battling when Daniel was praying. Your prayers influence what is happening with angelic beings in the spiritual realm as you are praying and that warfare is taking place you are giving them the strength your prayers that are going to the father are releasing more and more angels in the spiritual realm engaged in that battle every demon and every devil that you lit that you deal with isn't one that's just inside of a person there's four different levels here so you have got to have this weapon and understand the strength and the power of this weapon. This is pushing that button that shoots that bomb a thousand miles away with laser precision. This is why when Jesus said this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Prayer. This is that long distance weapon. Now, let's continue on because what we have here is we have a system of this armor that Paul is describing that is primarily defensive in nature. And then we're given the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is absolutely awesome and can be used as a weapon in combat all the time. And Jesus himself set that standard and gave that example when he used that weapon during his fast to defeat Satan. Before he began his earthly ministry. But guess what Jesus didn't have at that time. To use against Satan. The other two offensive weapons that you have. The name of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to explain it right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Get your pad and paper out right here. Get your pad and paper out in the name of Jesus. Let's rock. Come on, y'all. These are your three offensive weapons. See, Jesus was only able to use one of these in his earthly ministry. Why couldn't he use the blood of Jesus against Satan? Because his, his blood hadn't been shed yet. His blood hadn't been shed yet. Why couldn't he use his name against Satan? Because Jesus hadn't been glorified yet. Everybody grab that? Because that is deep right there. Jesus was using the weapon that he had at that time, which was the word of God. He used it against Satan three times in that fast. And it worked. Bam, bam, and bam. That was the weapon that Jesus had to use at that time. But since his death, burial, and resurrection, and Jesus being glorified at the right hand of the Father, we now, according to what the Lord Jesus said, have two more weapons at our disposal. 
One because of what Jesus said and one because of what he did. And one of them is Jesus's blood and the blood of Jesus, which absolutely defeated Satan on the cross. And the other is Jesus's name, which he instructed us to use. Those are your other two offensive weapons right here. Everybody grab this. I'm telling you, we do a lot of spiritual warfare. You know, it's real. You've seen them cast out. This is part of your armor. In Jesus name. That's why Paul listed everybody stops at six points of armor. They list the five defensive points and the one offensive point being the sword of the spirit. And they leave out Paul the, with the nuclear option to fire that ballistic missile that can hit somebody sitting over there reading a newspaper in Iraq. Which was prayer and all prayer and all supplication with perseverance. I don't know how folks could leave that weapon out because Paul sure didn't. And why did he know that that would be effective in that moment? Because he knew that he could use the name of Jesus. Because he had done it in the book of Acts. Peter had done it in the book of Acts as well. And he could use the blood of Jesus because that's where Satan's ultimate defeat took place on the cross of Calvary. Write this down and get your notepad now. Praise God. Your weapons. Number one. The word of God. We're going to be doing some scripture reading here now. We're going to list some scriptures. We're going right now. Somebody drop it in the chat. Hebrews chapter one, verse three. For anybody out there that loves to take notes, the folks out there taking notes tonight is your night. You're going to want to keep these and share these with somebody that you love. Hebrews chapter one. Verse three. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. The first weapon that you have is the word of God upholding all things by the word of his power. Next verse. In the Old Testament. Going to Ecclesiastes. I'm not asking you to go find it. I'm asking you to drop it in the notes. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 8. Verse 4. Somebody drop it in the chat. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4. Let's rock y'all. Where the word of a king is. There is power. I'm going to read it again. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Who is the king? Jesus. 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 Grab that. Grab that. Praise God. Grab that. Let's go, y'all. Going back to Isaiah. Isaiah. Chapter 55, drop it in the chat for everybody to take the notes. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. This is the power in the word of God as an offensive weapon. It will not return to God void. In Jesus name, it will accomplish. It will accomplish for what God sent it. Praise God. Moving on, y'all. We're going to Psalms. I know we're going kind of fast, y'all, but we only got a limited amount of time. We want to get it all in. Psalms. 107. Psalms 107, verse 20. Psalm 107, verse 20. Drop it in the chat. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. I'll read it again. I need everybody to grab it. 
he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Next scripture reference. We're going to the New Testament, y'all. We're going to Mark. Mark. Chapter 16. Last chapter in Mark. Mark chapter 16. Last ver verse in Mark. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Drop it in the chat. Mark 16, 20. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. The Lord went with them confirming the word. Understand that the word of God is an offensive weapon against the enemy. Praise God. Last scripture here. We'll do two more. Go to John. And I got a lot of notes here, y'all. I got a lot of notes here. That doesn't mean we're going to take them all, but there's a lot. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Drop it in the chat. John 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatever you ask, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified. Excuse me, y'all. That was the last verse right there. Let me stop right there. That was the last word right there. I need Okay, let me put this down right here. I'm telling you, I got a lot of notes right here. Go here right now. Write this down. Write this down in your notes for the word of God. We're going to we're going to conclude right there the section on the word of God because I don't want to we're going to not get bogged down in too much scripture here. You've got plenty of references right there to understand that the word of God is an offensive weapon against the enemy. Write this down in conclusion of the word of God being an offensive uh, a, a weapon against Satan, against all levels of demonic activity. Write this down. The word of God activates the power of God. Write it down in quotes. The word of God activates the power of God. Let's go. The word of God activates the power of God. Now. Your second offensive weapon. Your second offensive weapon. Is the name of Jesus. Go to the book of Mark. Drop it in the chat. Mark 16 again. This is the second weapon, the second offensive weapon that you have against your enemy. Okay. Mark 16 verse 17. Remember now, when Jesus defeated Satan during his 40 day fast that he did, Jesus defeated him by the word of God. We understand in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, that the offensive weapon that is listed there is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But right after that, Paul lists praying with all prayer and supplication, and all perseverance. That is your intercontinental ballistic missile. Because when Jesus defeated Satan right there in that desert during that fast, he used the word of God, but he didn't have the blood of Jesus because his blood hadn't been shed yet. And he didn't have the name of Jesus because he had not been glorified yet. Watch this now. Now we're on to the name of Jesus as your second offensive weapon. The third offensive weapon is going to be the blood of Jesus. Second offensive weapon, the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name. They will cast out demons. Stop right there. We're talking about spiritual warfare. In my name, they will cast out demons. In whose name? In Jesus' name. Let's go. Next reference, John. Let's go back to the book of John. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatever you ask in my name, 
and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Get it. Get it, y'all. Next verse, Ephesians. Back to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 21. This is Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Jesus' name is above every principality, every power, every dominion. Jesus' name is above every name. Folks. We've got to get this revelation that through your union with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are his representative here on this earth. Listen to me. I'm going to break this down right now, and everybody's going to grab it right now. You see this watch right here? This watch? My wife gave me this watch as a wedding gift, okay? This watch right here. Now, we're going to say for a moment that this watch right here has a chip in it, okay? It's a high-tech watch, and it's got a chip in it that can unlock certain doors. The only key to those doors is in this watch. There's no physical key. There's no pad, no number to punch. The way in to these secured places that are locked down that nobody else can enter and nobody else has access to is in this watch. Everybody got that. I take this watch off and I give it to Diana Hargrove. And I said, Diana, I want you to, when you get an opportunity to drive over to that room, go into that office there and get in that cabinet and grab that case out of there. Here's the watch. And Diana puts the watch on. Diana's got the watch on. And she goes to that door. That's locked off. To every other person in the world. Every spirit being. Every demonic spirit. Is locked off. Locked off. To every other human being. Unless they are born again. It is locked off. And Diana's got this watch on. And she goes up there and goes, beep, and the door opens, and she is in. You see this watch right here? This watch is the name of Jesus. It is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And when you become a born-again Christian, when you are born again, and you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Lord of your life. You get one of these. You get one of these from Jesus. You got one, Armando. You get one from Jesus. You have that ability. And when you go into spiritual warfare, you can't do nothing in your own strength. You can't do nothing against the enemy or Satan or any other demonic principality or power. In your own strength, in your flesh, without that watch. But when you got that watch, you got access. And the enemy knows it. And he has to obey. He recognizes the authority that you have because you got that watch on. And you can open that door and grab that briefcase out and take the sword of the spirit and whack him. And he knows it. See, the problem is a lot of folks don't know this. They can sit there and quote the Bible at Satan and he's laughing. Listen to me now. 
It's by revelation of the Holy Ghost right now. A pastor can sit there and speak and declare scripture against the enemy that has somebody demonized and possessed. And Satan is laughing. You might get the person to squirm around on the floor a little bit. Because he doesn't got the revelation of the name of Jesus that as he's speaking the name of Jesus, it's as if as if the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking the word right there. It's as if the Lord Jesus was speaking that same word 2000 years ago. This is the power that is in the name of Jesus, that each and every person that can hear the sound of my voice that is born again, you have it. And you've got to use it. You have got to use it as an offensive weapon. Jesus couldn't use it when he was fighting Satan in the, in the wilderness, when they had that battle right there. Jesus had the word of God is what he had to use. God in the flesh had the word of God to use in that moment. We are blessed. Jesus said, it's better for you if I go. In my name, he said. You will ask and you'll receive. In my name, I will do it. In my name. Please grab that. If you don't have that revelation before we end the service tonight, we will pray. Matter of fact, we're going to pray for it right now. Father, we ask you right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior, that every person that can hear the sound of my voice receives the revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit that is in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, give us the revelation of the power that is in the name of Jesus, that the access that we have to use the name of Jesus, that it is ours to use, that it is ours to use, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, give us the, re the revelation that we represent you here on the earth in the name of Jesus, that Jesus Christ is glorified in everything that we say and everything that we do. And that we have power and dominion over Satan in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, give us the revelation right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay. Moving on. Because that's not the last offensive weapon we have. And that'd be spectacular. If we had the word of God, which is what the Lord Jesus used, in addition to the name of Jesus, which is awesome. Praise God. But we have another weapon in our arsenal. And it's awesome. It is awesome. And it is the blood of Jesus. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going all the way back, y'all. Ooh, we're going back there now. We're going into Leviticus, y'all. We're going in Leviticus. Chapter 17. Verse 11. Drop it in the chat. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Here we go. I'm going to read it right now. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul I'm going to read it again for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Okay. Now. Please grab this right now. In the Old Testament. The shedding of blood of an animal. Was used. For the forgiveness of sins of the people. Why? Because the life of the flesh was in the blood. The penalty of sin was death. Therefore, in order to meet that penalty before God Almighty required a life. Everybody got that? 
it required a life. So God made a substitution that would continue to have to take place. And it was the life of an animal once a year on the Day of Atonement, a bull. A goat, a ram, a lamb. Everybody got that. That blood, that life force that was in that animal would be coming out of that animal and make an atonement for the people. Everybody got that. Okay. Very important. The Lord Jesus's blood was the purchasing price. For our forgiveness. For our forgiveness for our sins and the sins of all mankind that would ever be committed. It required a ransom. Everybody got that? It required a ransom. When mankind sinned, when Adam sinned and committed that treason, we were now Satan's. We belonged to the enemy in that moment. We had created separation from God as a human race. We belonged to the enemy. In order for us to be brought back to God required a ransom. And the price of that ransom was the perfect sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's continue on. Grab a hold of that right now. Let's continue on. Let's look at a couple more scriptures here. Let's go to Proverbs. We're going to actually stay in the Old Testament for just a second. Been a lot of teaching, a lot of preaching on the blood of Jesus. I got a whole, I got a whole video out there on it. We love the blood of Jesus. It gets me excited. My wife will tell you that when I hear somebody say the blood of Jesus, I feel like I could do 15 backflips in a row. I'm not kidding you. Kelly Grace will tell you, when I hear somebody say the blood of Jesus, I get a thrill in my soul. Praise God. I want you to all have that as well. Let's go to Proverbs right here. Proverbs. 26. You're going to stretch here. You're going to stretch a little bit. Proverbs 26, verse 2. Drop it in the chat. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, So a curse without cause shall not alight. I'm going to read the second part again. So a curse without cause shall not alight. Now, you will remember that the Lord Jesus Christ said that Satan has nothing in me. Everybody understand that the Lord Jesus said that at one time in his earthly ministry. So the prince of this world is coming, he said, but he has nothing in me, nothing in me. He had nothing to grab a hold of in Jesus because he was that perfect, sinless one because he was God in the flesh. When you, as a born again believer, are walking in right standing with God, having been forgiven for your sins and washed clean in the blood of Jesus, as long as you are walking in that light, Nothing can attach itself to you because Satan has nothing to attach to because you have been cleansed by that precious all cleansing blood of Jesus. It's just as if Satan were trying to put a curse on Jesus or put a bad thing on Jesus. Now, if you come out from under that blood and go back into that sinful life through ignorance or disobedience, Guess what? You fair game and the enemy's sitting there waiting. And that's why it's so important that the moment you do miss the mark, you go back to Jesus according to 1 John 1, 9, and you ask for forgiveness. And he is faithful and just to cleanse you in his blood from all sin and all unrighteousness. And that's what that scripture says. And that's why. 
Because when you are cleansed in the blood of Jesus, no curse and nothing that Satan tries to put on you can alight on you because he has nothing in you, just like Jesus said. Everybody got that? Because you got to have that, man. You got to know that to walk in that type of victory. This is why I am constantly, constantly telling folks, plead the blood of Jesus over your children. Plead the blood of Jesus over your grandchildren. Because when they're covered in the blood, nothing that the enemy sins can attach to them. Nothing can alight upon them. It's extremely important. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Somebody say praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Okay, next scripture. <clears throat> Going to the book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Holy Ghost fire fall on your church right now in Jesus name. Jesus. OK. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven. In him. Wait. Everybody pray for 30 seconds right now. If you got your prayer language, use it. If you don't, just lift up your hands and praise Jesus right now. If you're praying in English, lift up your hands where you're at right now and praise Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Jesus. Ephesians. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Let's try this again. Holy Ghost, here we go. In him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, According to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Back to verse seven. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. This is something that the Lord has done. This is something that the Lord Jesus has done. It's nothing that any of us could earn. It's nothing that we deserved. This is something that the Lord has done. He has supplied us with the whole armor of God. He has supplied us with every defensive resource and system that is necessary to stand against all evil. The Lord has done this. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. But the Lord has also equipped us with weapons, spiritual warfare weapons, that he himself did not even have. When he was on the earth in his earthly ministry, which is his name and his blood. <laughs> Jesus. And when you use the word of God 
mixed with the name of Jesus by speaking the name of Jesus and using the blood of Jesus as an offensive weapon against your enemy. And you have that revelation that you have the right to use the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the word of God against Satan and that all of heaven will back your play. The enemy has no chance against you and he knows it. And that is when he will flee from you as if in terror. Praise God.